Hello and welcome to New Frontiers on CCTV International. I'm Ji Xiaojun in Beijing. And today we're continuing our journey exploring the fascinating history and development of Kunqi Opera, one of the most popular forms of traditional opera in China today. Kunqi Opera can trace its origins back to the Ming Dynasty about 600 years ago and a small town south of the Yangtze called Kunshan. 200 years later, Kunshu entered its golden age with the staging of Tang Xianzu's masterpiece, The Peony Pavilion. And a further 200 years after that, Chinese opera entered the age in which different genres merged. However, the new forms of opera were in reality nurtured by Kunshu opera. Foremost among these new opera forms was Peking opera. Mei Lanfang was a master Peking opera performer, but his career was closely related to Kun Chu. Mei Lanfang first appeared on stage in Beijing's Guanghe Theatre in 1904 when he was just 10 years old. And on that occasion, he was playing a role in The Palace of Eternal Life, a Kun Chu opera. However, his systematic study of Kunchu began after he had made substantial progress in his career. Beginning from 1914, he learned and played roles in 30 or so Kunchu highlights. The Kunchu highlights he appeared in included Broken Bridge, Worldly Attraction, Love Story from a Musical Instrument, and Havoc at School. Later, these became representative of his repertoire. But very importantly, he introduced elements of Kuen Chu into Peking opera performance. Mei Lanfang had a deep understanding of Kuen Chu. Mei Da Shi Shen Qian said, "After Kuen Chu, we will be able to play the part." Acting is just one area in which Peking Opera benefited from Kuen Chu. Of the Peking Operas performed today, many were adapted from Kuen Chu. The magic of Chinese opera has come down to the present day by being passed by the performers of one generation to another, thus surviving the erosion caused by dynastic change. When the 
不光是京剧，地方戏曲，比如像像马兰从事的，像地方戏曲，他们往往一些重要的人物，比如像严凤英这样，他一定要到昆曲的老师傅那儿再学两首。严凤英 went from being a countryside girl to the leading figure in Huang Mei Opera, which at the time was a very young opera form. Like other successful actors and actresses, in her early years, her talents were nurtured by Kunchu. The Gan family home in Nanjing was the largest residential house in China among commoners. Before the liberation, its owner was Gan Gongsan, a well-known Kunchu master known as the King of the Flute in South China. Back in those years, his house saw many Kunchu events, often with people singing without musical accompaniment. In the 1940s, when Yan Fengying was going through a very hard time, she met Gan Luju, fourth son of the Gan family, and he introduced her to his father. Gan 老啊，好像有那么好的演员，我都不知不相信，就把他找去看看。他嗓子很好，一一一唱了一出以后，学了两句，唱了一出，你觉得哎，嗓子挺好，我外公就发现他了。就叫他，他儿子干绿枝了。还有这个这个女儿啊，就跟她说昆曲，开始吧。是她说昆曲影响，然后一直不断呢，一直不断就是到了，呃，华东汇演。Due to her performance in Tian Shan Pei Heavenly Marriage. Yan Fengying won first prize in an opera festival held in the autumn of 1954 in eastern China that covered five provinces. Everyone was greatly impressed by her singing and acting, and after the festival, famous dramatist Tian Han encouraged her to work for even greater success. So Tian Han just said, "You go up one level, I'll introduce you. I'll introduce you to a good master. For you, it's the Sun Yuan Shan of Yuan Shan." Bai Yuancheng was a famous Kunchu master of the northern style, and he was a very tough teacher. He was able to pinpoint all the areas in which Yan Fengying needed to improve. It wasn't only in the melodies and acting that Quinchu's influence was evident. Elements were borrowed from Quinchu opera by such emerging new opera forms, such as Sichuan opera. For time immemorial along this stretch of the Yangtze River in Sichuan province, boat songs echoed among the mountains. Yet even this remote place where life was a perpetual struggle was not without Quinchu. When the Sichuan Opera Troupe was busy rehearsing for an arts festival in the autumn of 2006, familiar old Kunchu melodies could be heard again. There are five singing styles in Sichuan Opera, Kun, Gao, Hu, Tan and Dong, but Kun is the dominant one. This song, featuring a typical Kuinchu melody, comes from a drama named Yi Dan Da, Courage and Boldness, and it's a melody that frequently appears in Sichuan opera. During the reign of Emperor Kangxi, Kuinchu in Sichuan was far from strong, but during the reign of Emperor Tongzhi, Kuinchu opera fan Wu Tang took office as the governor of Sichuan, and the situation began to change. 他就非常喜欢昆曲，当时从江苏来了八个擅长昆曲者。这个班社来了以后，还给他买了说是有上百亩的地，就是可以养活这个班社。他又把这个成都江南会馆，也就是江浙一带的会馆、江南会馆，划拨给这个呃昆曲班。这些会馆里边都是他们的演出场所，所以那个时候基本上就昆曲就在四川扎了根。昆曲 was soon appearing on stage in many theaters, 
At the Provincial Sichuan Opera Research Association, we found this old program of a Kuenchu performance in Chengdu. Yulai Tea House was the place where San Qing, the largest Sichuan opera troupe, performed in the late years of the Qing dynasty, at a time when Kuenchu was already in decline and was having to share the stage with other forms. This was a trend that was also seen in Sichuan. Here in this place, Kuenchu highlights were seen on the same stage with Sichuan opera, and the latter absorbed a great deal from Kuenchu. In one way or another, these opera forms all learned from and influenced each other. Step by step, they reached a summit in development. In some ways, they're like different peaks of the same mountain range or tributaries of the same river. Kuenchu is a very important school, you know? It's also a part of the education of people. It's also a part of the education of other people. 昆曲的那种内敛的美，那种古典东方的那种雅致，这是黄梅戏需要吸收的。在沈国景皇下面，完是中计，我们再去中正张构成，忘记不了昆曲。实际上，它是给经济输出了多少多少营养，它的基本的这种课，通过课程里的这种营养题材来丰富你京剧的表演。In the city of Suzhou, one day in the autumn of 1921, enrollment notices on red paper appeared in many of the city's streets. However, they were not for the usual type of school, but for a special one, a Kuenchu workshop where tuition, board and lodgings would be free. In due course, this Kuenchu workshop admitted some 40 students, all of them from poor families. Years later, people would refer to these 40-plus graduates as Kuen Chu's Chuan Generation. One member of this group was Ni Chuan Yu, who is now 99 years old. All of his classmates have passed away and just memories remain. Great speaking opera master Mei Lanfang recalled, during the reigns of Emperor Tongzhi and Guangxu, all students of opera in Beijing learned both Peking opera and Kunqiu. After 1900, however, they learned Peking opera only. In the early years of the 20th century, China was experiencing great social turmoil. By that time, Kunqiu had long ceased to be the dominant form on stage. In fact, there was not one professional Kuenchu opera troupe in the whole of Beijing. The stage was now completely dominated by Peking opera. Inside the Suzhou Kuenchu Museum, we can learn about what remained of Kuenchu in the early 20th century. By that time, even Suzhou, the birthplace of Kuenchu, was no hive of Kuenchu activity. Just four troops were still in business in the city, Zhuanfu, Da Zhang, Da Ya, and Hongfu, and they were having a difficult time of it. The leading performer of the Zhuanfu troupe was Shan Yuechuan, but to make a living, he and his colleagues had to tour from place to place in Jiangsu and Zhejiang provinces. In the end, however, all this effort proved futile, and in 1923, Chuanfu, the last troop still active, disbanded. The long history of Kuenchu in Suzhou had come to an end, leaving the exquisite stage costumes to gather dust in abandoned wardrobes. The disbanding of Suzhou's last Quinchu troupe in 1923 apparently marked the end of Quinchu opera.
The world was changing fast, and there was no place for quenchy opera in it. And yet, the quenchy tradition survived. This was thanks largely to a group of educated people who strove to preserve it by establishing a quenchy workshop. In 2006, famous Taiwan writer Bai Xianyong brought his young people's version of the Peony Pavilion to Peking University. It was an unheard of event, a traditional Kuenchu drama being staged in a university. Yet students packed the theatre, creating a scene that otherwise existed only in memory. In 1917, a number of new faces appeared among the staff of Peking University, and many of them would later become famous. Among these newcomers was Chen Du Xiao, an established scholar in humanities, Li Da Zhao, a professor of economics and the curator of the university's library, Professor Hu Shi in humanities, and Zhou Zuoren, a notable figure in the field of library systems. But as famous as these four would be, their arrival was quiet compared to that of Professor of Opera Wu Mei from Suzhou. Zhou Zuoren, who arrived in the same year as Wu Mei, recalled with some amusement how Wu Mei made his debut at the university. He said, Wu Mei was the first professor of opera the university had ever employed, and his arrival caused a sensation in Shanghai newspapers. To them, including opera in the university's curriculum was inconceivable. Wu Mei had a very peculiar way of lecturing. He would hold a flute in his hand, stroll into the classroom, and sing Kuen Chu tunes to the students. Wu Mei told his students that what he was singing was quite different from Peking opera, which was so very popular in the city at the time. It was Kuen Chu. Zhen 有一点做到了，就是昆曲是一直在传下来了，这正是感谢他们的远见做事。还有一点非常好好玩的一点呢，就是它是传下来的过程当中，还是一直保持着受到高层文化人的支持，一直保持着。我们井上贝先生。In October 2006, world-famous architect and Suzhou native Eo Mingpei returned to his hometown for the inauguration of Suzhou Museum, which he designed. The newly completed museum was not far from Zhong Wangfu, the former residence of the Prince of Zhong, and Zhuozhang Garden, and it was very close to Eo Mingpei's family temple, Shuzhiling Garden. Every member of Eo Mingpei's family was good at singing Kunchu. His uncle, Bei Jinmei, was known as a versatile Kunchu performer who could sing well and play musical instruments. The Kunchu workshop referred to earlier was established by Bei Jinmei, Zhang Zedong, and Xu Jingqing, another master Kunchu singer. And the three pulled 1,000 silver dollars for the purpose. Little could they know that this act, seemingly accidental, would save Kuen Chu from extinction. Eighty years ago, in the northwest of Suzhou, on a street called Tao Hua Wu, there was a private garden named Wu Mu that enjoyed a fine reputation. But today, aside from dedicated Kuen Chu fans, few know it ever existed. The garden was Bei Jinmei's private property, and it became the venue for the Kun Chu workshop. This is 
This is the layout of the garden as drawn by Ni Chuan Yu, a Kuan Chu artist from the Chuan generation. When the workshop's name board was affixed above the entrance in 1921, many juveniles turned up to try their luck. Shen Yuchuan, an old performer with the Chuan Fu troupe, examined each of the contenders, and from them, he picked around 40. As they learned their Kuan Chu skills, they could never have imagined that the tragic fate that would befall the older generation teaching them would mean that they would be entrusted with preserving a great heritage. Due to financial problems, before long the workshop found itself unable to continue. Mu Ou-Chu had studied in universities in Chicago, Wisconsin and Illinois, and after he returned, he had thrown himself into the manufacturing industry to help fulfill the dream of salvaging the nation from its backward state. Earlier, a cotton yarn tycoon in Shanghai had sponsored five students from Peking University to study abroad. As one of the first to receive this Western education, Mu Ou-Chu came to the conclusion that the new culture was a way to salvage the nation. But despite this, he was still interested in traditional art forms and often made trips to Suzhou to learn Kuan Chu from Yu Sulu, a Kuan Chu master. Learning of the financial difficulties the workshop suffered, Mu took it over and began bringing it back to life. So Neither Bei Jinmei nor Mu Ouzhu was able to give any thought to the question of the future lives of the students. At the time, it simply wasn't possible. But in any event, Kuan Chu was still active as an art form, and with the financial problems solved, for the moment at least, the workshop was able to continue. Uh, now, just imagine the scene. It's 100 years ago, and inside Humu Garden in Suzhou, a couple of opera masters are teaching their students the lyrics and tunes.
But outside the garden wall, unbeknown to the students, China is experiencing massive change. Thank you for staying with us on today's New Frontiers and tune in again next time when we'll bring you more about the history and development of Quinchy Opera. I'm Chi Xiaojun from CCTV International. See you next time.